The lectures that you've been hearing this Lent have been partly autobiographical. And because that will affect what I say about the Kingdom of God and the Church today, it's important that you know where I'm coming from and why. Now, you remember that the first lecture began with the Kingdom of Heaven as explored by Arthur Clutton Brock. And you'll remember that it discussed those experiences of the holy and the numinous, which produced, in the memorable phrase of John Ruskin, a kind of heart hunger. And this is where my own path into Christian faith began. Neither of my parents' families had had any connection with organised Christianity for generations, as far as I know. So my first exposure to organised religion was through the Christian hymns, prayers and readings from the Bible at the daily assembly at secondary school. And I think it's such a pity that that seems to have been forgotten about largely. These, however, did not particularly affect me. What affected me were the walks that I did as a teenager on the South Downs near Guildford and Rygate in Surrey, together with the English folk song inspired music of Rafe Vaughan Williams and Gustav Holst. These certainly inspired feelings that can be described as heart hunger and which meant that the obsession of my life in my teenage years was music. A significant point in my life in which the kingdom of heaven became the kingdom of God was attendance at an even song in 1954, first Sunday after Trinity. I was on leave from my national service in the Royal Air Force. And I went to my local church, St Andrew's Earlsfield, in South London. It had been built at the end of the 19th century and had an imposing high altar and sanctuary. Although it was situated on a main road, there was little traffic on a Sunday evening in 1954, and the church had a marvellous atmosphere of stillness and coolness compared with the summer warmth outside. The simple liturgical service, the prayers which had a worldwide concern, the sermon which was based on the gospel for the day, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, all enabled me to connect the heart hunger feelings of the kingdom of heaven with the kingdom of God as expressed in Christian worship and witness. That experience was neither the beginning nor the end of my journey into faith, but it was an important milestone. It set me on to an intensive study of the parables of Jesus and of his teaching on the kingdom of God and determined my future as one who wished to become a full-time disciple of Jesus in the ordained ministry. I still had one important step to take. In churches that I attended, there was little or no attention paid to the parables of Jesus or his teaching about the kingdom of God. I heard a great deal about the Lord Jesus Christ, about whom I was expected to believe certain things, especially how God had punished him so that the sins of mankind could be forgiven. What I had to do was to connect what I found in the writings of Paul and John with what I found in the first three Gospels, the teaching of Jesus about the kingdom. And indeed, of course, this was what the fourth of this year's lectures was about. And I shall come back to that later. 
but it exemplified the theological problem that is going to be important in this lecture of how Jesus, who is the witness to faith and the author of faith in the first three Gospels, becomes the object of faith in the writings of Paul, John's Gospel, and the creeds and formularies of the church. We are back to Clutton Brock's inquirer of the first lecture, who looked in vain in the creeds and formularies for information about the kingdom of God. Now, I shall not say anything more about my own path into faith, but I hope that what I've said will become clearer as the lecture proceeds. The fact that it was a church service which for me made the connection between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God has always made me concerned that whatever else worship did, it should convey something of the mystery and majesty of God, that it should be something that not merely engaged the mind and thought, but something that engaged the emotions. This means that personally, aesthetically, I have never found it easy to engage in the kind of non-liturgical worship which used to characterise the free churches, and of course many of them are now more liturgical, but which seems increasingly to be a feature of some Anglican churches. Ideally, Christian worship should convey something of the numinous. And although I'm not particularly high church myself, it is in high church services that I've found that element to be more frequently present. Here at the Abbey, I'm grateful for the very small fact that the geography of the present chapel, where I'm standing, means that celebrants at the service of Holy Communion must stand with their backs to the congregation. Now, there is, of course, that rather charming story in Gregory Dix's book, The Shape of the Liturgy, a book written when celebrants always had their backs to the congregation, when, unless they were really diehard evangelicals who, who stood at the north side. Dix recalls what I think one of his aunts had been told. This was that at a particular point in the communion service, a live crab was released onto the altar, and it was the job of the officiating priest to make sure that no one in the congregation saw it, and that the gestures and motions through which the celebrant went came about because he was trying to catch the unfortunate crab without the congregation seeing it. Rather charming story, and perhaps you've been to services where that might have been a reasonable explanation. Now, I must confess that when I go to communion services where celebrants face the congregation, I sometimes become too aware of the manual actions which are being performed during the service, which I can very well see. Perhaps I shouldn't be looking. But I often find them quite off-putting and not conducive to getting some sense of the numinous at that point in the service. Now, no one obviously wishes to see celebrants with their backs to the congregation behaving as though they were trying to conceal a crab. Um, I hope I don't create that impression at the Abbey. You'll, you'll reassure me otherwise, I hope. But I wonder if celebrants who face congregations realise how off-putting their visible actions can be sometimes to the congregations they face. Another factor here concerns the liturgy that is used. The Anglican Church has become very wordy. Congregations are faced either with books containing various liturgies or words are projected onto screens. There is something to be said for having the same liturgy each week, which people know by heart and which can enable them to concentrate their minds on the significance of what is happening, 
rather than concentrating on reading the words presented to them. The use of Elizabethan English may also enable the liturgy to convey a certain dignity and detachment from the present world. Although I would not want to advocate having services in Latin, I can quite understand that the use of Latin, to which congregations had become accustomed, could have played an enormous part in conveying the sense of the holy and the numinous in worship. Now, this may all sound very reactionary, and no doubt is, and there may well be much better ways of meeting the points that I'm trying to make, but I think it is a serious issue that the church has to face. And it's interesting that the nine o'clock service, with which I was quite involved at one point, which was aimed at the sort of young person familiar with the club scene in Sheffield, used, in addition to contemporary music and dance, ancient liturgies, including Latin, so that there would be in the worship an element of the holy and the numinous let me pass from this perhaps less important aspect of the form of worship to the content of the church's preaching. Here we meet the problem of the distinction between Jesus as the witness to faith and the inspirer of faith in the first three Gospels, and Jesus as the object of faith in Paul and John and the rest of the New Testament. Should the emphasis on the church's preaching be upon Jesus as the witness to faith and the inspirer of faith, or on Jesus as the object of faith? Now, on the face of it, there is surely nothing to be discussed. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So it is stated in the letter to the Hebrews, Hebrews 13.8. If during his earthly ministry, Jesus inspired people to have faith in God, then surely he can do the same today. And the church's task is to acquaint people with his teaching, especially his parables. After all, are we able to improve upon the parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, of the great feast, of the lost sheep and the lost coin? Surely not. Surely all we have to do is to acquaint people with the teaching of Jesus and to rely in faith and trust upon his power to create faith in them. This might seem to be the obvious answer, and yet time and again, the church and its methods of evangelism have taken the other course. I can remember being at missions to more than one university, where, having tried to prove the existence of God, the missioner then tried to prove the divinity of Jesus. One sometimes comes across the argument that is found in C.S. Lewis, Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. Either he was a liar, or he was mad, or he was speaking the truth, with the implication that we must accept the latter, namely that he was speaking the truth, and therefore must believe that he was the Son of God. However, this is believing that, not believing in. Surely that is the wrong approach. Given that within our services we expect people to recite the creeds, creeds that are concerned with Jesus as the object of faith rather than as the witness to and inspirer of faith, it seems to me that we must go out of our way to put as much emphasis as possible on Jesus as the one who is the inspirer of faith. This is where the preaching should be concentrated, and the Christian faith should be presented as discipleship, as following Jesus today. But it will also be necessary, especially in study groups, so to study the writings of Paul and the Gospel of John that these two 
are then understood to bear witness to Jesus as the creator of faith rather than faith's object. At the Abbey, we've been trying to do that by studying 1 and 2 Corinthians in our uh, Bible study group. There are several wise sayings that point our thoughts in that direction. For example, it has been said that it is not the cross that saves, but Christ, but the Christ of the cross. Or to take another example, to believe in the resurrection is not to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, it is to believe in the risen Christ. Sermons that try to prove that the only possible answer to the question, one, what happened on Easter Day, is that Christ must have risen from the dead, confuse the issue between believing in Christ and believing about Christ. If we can get this right, this will be an important gain in our evangelistic outreach. It will also tackle the next topic about which we must think. If we preach Jesus as the witness to faith and as the inspirer of faith, we shall have to concentrate also on what he said about the kingdom of God. If the emphasis is on Jesus as the object of faith, little will be said about the kingdom of God, and we shall find ourselves back in the situation of Clutton Brock's inquirer, who could find nothing about the kingdom of heaven in the creeds and formularies of the church. But there is another consequence of concentrating upon Jesus as the object of faith, and that is the loss of the sense of urgency in the mission and preaching of Jesus. Jesus proclaimed that the kingdom of God was at hand, and as I explained in the first lecture, we can think of this in the sense of a taxi having arrived to take us to some destination. The taxi is not about to come or just around the corner. It is present, and its presence is affecting my situation here and now. Jesus' proclamation that the kingdom of God is at hand is something that has happened and that that event is now radically affecting the present. To concentrate upon Jesus as the object of faith and to ignore his actual teaching is to risk missing out on this vital element in his message. As it so often happens in the history of the church, things that are neglected in mainstream churches find ways of being emphasised at what we might call the margins of the church. Thus, for example, there are churches which pay a good deal of attention to the second coming of Jesus, even sometimes to the point of believing that it is to happen so soon that members of the congregations are discouraged from taking out life insurance on the ground that they will not need it because the world will soon come to an end. As I shall argue shortly, this kind of belief in the second coming misunderstands what Jesus meant by the end, but is at least an attempt to recapture this sense of urgency. Another interesting form that concern about Jesus and the future takes is what is called in American fundamentalism pre-millenarianism and post-millenarianism, things hardly known about even in English evangelicalism and yet big time in the United States. There are theological institutions there that take these things so seriously that students studying there have to subscribe their belief in pre-millenarianism or post-millenarianism, as the case may be. These beliefs are based upon 1 Corinthians 15 and Revelation 20 and take two forms. One form, pre-millenarianism, is the belief that the present age is the age dominated by Satan and that the second coming of Christ 
will put an end to this dominion and inaugurate the rule of a thousand years, which is described in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. The other view is that the death and resurrection of Jesus have already inaugurated the new millennium, that Christ now rules within it, and that the end will come when Christ hands over everything to the Father, as in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 to 26. One interesting consequence of pre-millenarianism, which is probably the predominant view among American fundamentalists, is that it is wrong to engage in the environmental movement to save the planet from global warning, warming. If the present age is dominated by Satan, then global warming and natural catastrophes are signs that Satan's dominion is beginning to weaken. Therefore, any attempt to prevent global warming and its consequences is in effect assisting Satan to maintain his hold over the present age. This view encourages groups to deny that there is evidence for global warming and to, and to deny that anything should be done to mitigate its effects. This is a terribly serious consequence of what happens when the message of Jesus about the end is misunderstood. In order to try to understand the teaching of Jesus about the end, it is necessary to define two senses of end. Uh, and last week, uh, Linda uh, brought some interesting mathematical uh, models to help us, though, though I can't go into those. I'm not competent to. The best way I can do this, and there may be better ways, is by thinking of an extremely well-written detective novel. It may be 379 pages long. If you are reading page 200, you can say that the novel ends at page 379. However, there is another sense in which the novel has an end. And that is the point at which much that has been obscure during the course of the novel will become clear. The guilty person will be unmasked and clues that pointed towards him or her early in the novel will now make sense. The end, therefore, will not simply just mean the last page, but the conclusion which makes sense of everything which has gone before. Imagine now that you are reading that novel for the second time or that you've cheated by looking at the last pages before you've finished reading it. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> if you already know how the novel concludes, you will read it in quite a different way compared with reading it when you do not know how it will end. You will see where the clues are pointing to, whereas previously you did not necessarily know that they were clues or what they amounted to. Now, this may not be a very good illustration of what I'm trying to say, but when Jesus says that the kingdom of God has arrived, he means that the end that will make sense of everything is already present, operating in the world and making some sense of what may not seem to be particularly logical. It is here, I think, that we most locate those elements in the parables that seem to us to be illogical and unfair. In the parable of the prodigal son, for example, a value, that of overwhelming and undeserved grace, is being revealed, which is part of the end that is now present in the world, but which seems so contradictory to our notions of fairness and loyalty. Although, of course, deeper study of the parable may help us to appreciate that value and why it is so important that it should play a part in our world. 
My criticism of those who concentrate upon the second coming or on premillenarianism is that they have misunderstood what Jesus meant by the end. They are thinking of the last pages of the novel as opposed to that end of the novel which makes sense of what is going on in the course of its pages. Another way of putting this is that Christians should have a lively sense that they are living in two ages, the present age and the age to come, which has drawn near in the ministry, death and exaltation of Jesus, and which is a real part of the world in which we live today. After the third lecture, somebody remarked to me that an emphasis that used to be made in the church between the already and the not yet does not seem to be particularly prominent nowadays. I think that this was a perceptive observation. One of the ways in which we can have this sense that the kingdom of God is among us is by taking seriously what was passionately believed by Ernst Lohmeyer, and which I mentioned in an earlier lecture, that the kingdom in our world is present in the parables and teaching and words of Jesus to which we must pay particular attention. This brings me to the next section. You have heard me say on more than one occasion that I always feel uneasy when I read the first three Gospels and see the simplicity and freshness of Jesus proclaiming the kingdom of God and then compare this with the church as we find it today. The Church of England has become very much part of the establishment. It is governed by a synod, which is sometimes called the Church's Parliament, and although it is not as bad as the Westminster Parliament, thank goodness, it has nonetheless absorbed some of the less wholesome aspects of the Westminster Parliament, including parties, i.e. evangelical, liberal, Anglo-Catholic, uh, has absorbed party discipline and voting upon party lines. Elections of representatives to the General Synod have in recent years become very much a party issue within the Church of England. It is true, of course, that from time to time, the archbishops and the bishops voice their concerns about social problems. And recently, there have been statements about the extent of poverty in Britain and the consequences of this. Unfortunately, for many people outside the church, these are simply well-meaning voices articulating what some may see as good humanitarian issues, while others may disagree violently, politically, with these opinions and think that archbishops and bishops should keep their noses out of such matters. What the Church, in its established um, format, fails to do, unfortunately, is to convey any idea that it represents a radical alternative to the world as we know it, that its founder, Jesus of Nazareth, proclaimed the closeness and actual working of a kingdom with values that radically questioned those of the world in which we live. This sense of unease that I have between the lack of fit between the Gospels and the Church has become more acute in the light of recent research upon the early Christian movement and the existence of Jesus and his followers as a radical itinerant group of preachers. Uh, I think of the work of the German scholar Gerd Tyson. And research on the Gospel of Matthew has indicated severe tensions within the community that produced this Gospel between those who were descended from the radical and itinerant disciples of Jesus who tried to continue their radical lifestyle and methods of preaching, and the needs of the settled Matthean community, of which these radicals were rather uneasy members. 
How do we cope with this? One way is by having a lively sense of church history in general, and those of us at the Abbey, of something of the Abbey here in particular. When we look back at the history of the church, we see that from time to time there have been radical movements within it that have become dissatisfied with the church as simply a part of the established states, seeking to uphold rather than challenge their polities. The monastic movements beginning of the fourth century were one such protest, as were the various reforms of the monasteries and religious orders as they too grew wealthy and complacent. Here at the Abbey, we remember our connection with St Norbert and the establishment of the Order of White Canons, who served at the Abbey for over 300 years. In the post-Reformation period in Britain, radical groups such as the Quakers and other dissenters expressed their opposition in various ways to the religion of the established churches. From my point of view, as an Old Testament scholar, it is interesting to note that at the Reformation, the English church establishment justified its existence by citing the example of kings in the Old Testament, such as David, Hezekiah and Josiah, who founded and reformed the royal cult in Jerusalem. When Edward VI came to the throne following the death of Henry VIII, he was greeted by Archbishop Cranmer as a new Josiah who would be able to purify the church according to Reformation principles. The radicals who later opposed the Anglican settlement and establishment drew extensively upon the prophetic traditions of the Old Testament, traditions that were highly critical of the kingship and indeed often of the cult. As I said in an earlier lecture, opposition to the temple and prophecies that God would destroy it were part of the agenda of the prophets. Knowing these things is important because they help us to see what we are doing in a wider perspective. And of course, we are in the unusual position at the Abbey of being an independent congregation, although within the broader Anglican communion. We use the traditional services of the Book of Common Prayer. And I've tried to say earlier in this lecture that such services have a part to play in conveying something of the numinous mystery of the worship of God. But in theology and practice, being outside the normal structures of the Church of England, we have the chance to try to embody in what we do the principles of the kingdom of God as preached by Jesus, doing this, of course, in the power of the Holy Spirit, who in the teaching of Paul is the power of the age to come but present among us. We have tried so far at the Abbey, and not without difficulty, to break away from some of the usual ideas about democratic representation and government in what we do. We are groping towards the idea that, as the body of Christ, and as members one of another, we are working not to maintain an organisation or an institution, but to seek to be an instance of the kingdom of God as proclaimed by Jesus and empowered by his Spirit. Now I want to conclude by referring to a book that was recommended to me many years ago by my philosophy teacher in Manchester, Professor Dorothy Emmett and which has been a constant source of inspiration for over 50 years. It is entitled The Two Moralities, and was written by the Oxford philosopher A.D. AD Lindsay at the invitation of Archbishop William Temple, and was the Archbishop's Lent book for 1940. In it, Lindsay describes what he calls 
the morality of my station and its duties, meaning the moral code which regulates the behaviour of any decent law-abiding citizen, breaches of which give society the right to punish or to exclude lawbreakers from the general round of daily life. He opposes to this what he calls the morality of grace, which he bases on the Sermon on the Mount and the teaching of Jesus, and some of the teaching of Paul especially, that on love. The morality of grace does not abolish or make unnecessary the morality of my station and its duties, but shows that alongside that morality is another deeper, profounder way of understanding reality without which humanity cannot achieve its divinely intended vocation. Without explicitly discussing the kingdom of God, although he mentions it in passing occasionally, Lindsay wonderfully describes the dialectical tension that exists in a world where the establishment of the kingdom of God in the ministry of Jesus is taken seriously and guides the lives of those who seek to follow Jesus. There is a wonderful description of the nature and task of the church from that point of view. I quote, It is the function of the church to form a community which is a fellowship where men, and of course he means women also, can live together in relations governed by a higher standard than prevails in society at large, to show by the example of her corporate life that the fact that men are all children of one father is a more effective fact than all their differences of ability and wealth and station. The actual life lived in the church ought in itself to be a living, effective, and constructive witness against the evils and failures of society. He goes on to stress the importance of what he calls prophecy, which, in a good Old Testament sense, he understands to involve not so much foretelling as forth-telling. I quote again, it is also the function of the church to produce prophets, and evidence of its vitality will be the fact that it is a school of the prophets, that the men and women who show us what society might do, who correct our blindness and indifference to the evils, are inspired by the church's fellowship. The church ought to go a long way to encourage liberty of prophesying, to be prepared to face all the scandal to which liberty of prophesying is bound to give rise. Lindsay goes on to say that prophesying is an individual thing and that although the church must support individual prophets, it cannot be a prophetic institution because that is not its function. I'm not sure that I agree with this. However, I agree with everything that he says a few lines further on. The challenging and revolutionary work of a real Christianity appears first as a living, actual transformation of life. It shows as new life breaking through the old growths which have served their purpose and are ready to decay. Its beginning brings the gift, not of a devastating clearance, a vacant institutionalism, but of a fresh green leaf significance of a new birth, a renewal of the spirit of life and love. That, I think, is a splendid description of some of the effects 
of the kingdom of God.